this video is looking at practicing unseen poetry skills and it's going to use a poem called Seventh Nerve by Rhiannon Houston. Now this is a poem that I came across a couple of months ago when it was the featured poem for Poem of the Week in The Guardian and if you google Seventh Nerve by Rhiannon Houston, I think you'll get that article. Now that's got um, a really nice um, prose analysis, a little bit informal for if you're looking at it as a model for exam writing, but the person who's critiqued it there has put down their ideas about the poem. So once you've had your um, thoughts about it and maybe listened to this and incorporated all of that together, it's also a good idea to, to Google Seventh Nerve by Rhiannon Houston and see if you can get that, that Guardian critique of it as well. So you're unlikely to have a copy of the poem um, unless you've been working with me. And therefore, I'm just going to let you have a read of it. Um, you can obviously screenshot and print this out if you need to. So we can see that Seventh Nerve, it, and there's a little bit of an explanation in prose at the top of the poem that says that Bell's palsy is a neurological condition, um, which is related to the seventh cranial nerve. And it gives you partial facial paralysis and pain on one side of the head. So that's what you need to understand going into this poem. And then just have a read of it and see if you can work it out. So here's page one. And then page two. OK, so looking at it then and approaching it kind of as an unseen poem and thinking, OK, how are we going to break this down? How are we going to practice those skills? Well, I would always look at the title and we know that kind of factually this is the area of damage and we're going to be looking at the kind of consequences of that. And it's the consequences, not just physically, but also psychologically for the speaker in this poem. And if you can, learn how to spell psychological for GCSE and A-level because it's really helpful once you've worked out that it's that P-S-Y start. Um, so we know that our speaker perhaps is going to be suffering from this Bell's palsy and therefore the initial um, kind of three lines or the two and a three quarter lines, we can then start to try and make sense of those within a medical context. And normally, you know, approaching an unseen poem, I say, look at the speaker. And I think we've got competing voices possibly here because these instructions and questions sound very much, sorry, up to here. So it's the first two lines sound very much like a medical professional kind of conducting an examination, trying to see what this patient, what this person with Bell's palsy can do. Or it is the speaker repeating those medical instructions, remembering those appointments that I'm going to say she because Rhiannon is um, a female name, so a female poet, could be a male character. Um, but we are going to say, you know, maybe thinking about those instructions that she's remembering from her last medical appointment. And they kind of get shorter and shorter and more abrupt in terms of that swallow. And I think you've almost got swallow wallow in there. Um, just because that occurs to me because of dive into the dark water. Um, and this line marks a kind of change. We carry on with these imperatives. So show, you know, um, try, close, swallow, these imperatives, that kind of command form of the verb. But you're not going to get a doctor or a technician saying, you know, dive into the dark water. And so it takes on more of a kind of symbolic voice as she remembers what goes on in these appointments. So it's like being in dark water and think of the symbolism of, you know, floating, disembodied, um, possibly dangerous, all the connotations of dark, um, largely monosyllabic in its instructions. It's simple. And then lie still while the machine passes round you and a voice reaches you from another room where music is playing. So this is kind of giving us insight into this is what these examinations involve. You are completely passive. So the speaker is, is emphasising how still she is. You know, you lie still, 
the machine passes round you. We changed into the kind of second person, that direct address, the effect of which is often drawing in the reader into the experience. It becomes more intimate. And we're called back by this question, is it just that side? Which is again, you know, kind of the voice of the, the medic again. And maybe, you know, that side, that idea, that angle, that experience maybe, um, could that work more symbolically? And our next stanza, if you're if you're up on your types of alliteration, you know automatically that plosives, plosive alliteration, P's, B's and D's, anything really that takes force from the mouth to say. So the problem here is that plosives soften to nothing. Language leaks from the corners of my mouth. So the speaker ironically can't speak or can't speak in the way that she wants to because this power, these powerful sounds become nothing because of her facial paralysis. She can't muster the force to shape the words. You know, the kind of a comment on the, I suppose, the cruelty of an awful lot of medical conditions are that they physically stop somebody expressing themselves whilst not impacting upon their their intellectual kind of capacity. So they carry on thinking exactly in the same way, but their body's letting them down. So plosives soften, soften to nothing. And the alliterated L language leaks, giving that kind of looseness to the idea that, you know, she, she can't speak properly. Language leaks from the corners of my mouth. You could talk about the enjambment there and the, li the line break leading that kind of idea that it's leaking onto the next line. Um, and she can't control her mouth. It kind of spills out of the corners. And then we have this kind of more metaphorical um, description of her experience that all night my eye, and notice it's eye singular, you know, she's kind of compromised. My eye tries to see into the dark and there is a wave in my ears that breaks and breaks. So we have those harsh um, K sounds, that consonance there, maybe kind of the brutality of the experience. And... The darkness is both literal in the middle of the night. She, you know, she's trying to focus on something and also maybe metaphorical, trying to make sense of her situation. And she maybe has some form of tinnitus, that, that condition where you're just kind of hearing strange noises and you can't get them to stop because there's problems with your, your ear. Um, or there's this relentless kind of um, pounding that's going on you know, the wave that breaks and breaks. Um, we have the the and, the kind of um, repetition of that and there, showing how these experiences are piling up, maybe threatening to overwhelm her. And then the repetition of this line from the first line, show me your teeth, and very deliberately split over the stanza. And it has an altogether kind of different feel. You know, this kind of command, show me, show me what's happening to you. But then the the idea of show me your teeth to me seems to be building up into this kind of more aggressive feeling, more snarly feeling. And what's that going to represent? Because this phrase keeps coming back throughout the poem, show me your teeth. Um, but this time, you know, show me your teeth, lift your arms. It's not a question this time, it's a command. So that's altered. Um, from the last time she's feeling more kind of ordered round or is she giving herself these commands and then the next one snarl like the weasel arcing after the rabbit that simile there is definitely taking it out of the medical sphere and into the um, ideas of aggression and power and fighting back you know this is happening to me I'm losing my power of speech I'm losing the ability to express myself don't give in without a fight that verb snarl with its connotation of aggression and the idea of being the weasel you know being the aggressor actually taking back that control and we've got the arcing the enjambment there kind of arcing through to the next line maybe then having introduced the idea of a kind of primitive and natural aggression, it's beast in the blinding light. You know, before we were in the dark, 
now we're in the blinding light. Now, is this a clinical medical scenario that she feels almost dehumanised as she's within this kind of cold clinical light, you know, trying to smile rather than snarl? Or is it this kind of um, revelation or epiphany or realisation she's having that she needs to kind of do something? And, you know, the animal imagery is continued. And again, the plosives here are back. You know, these were the plosives that were leaking from her mouth. Now they're all softening to nothing and as language leaked, they're now beast in the blinding light with a burnt tongue. Okay, so it's it's more forceful, it's more powerful. Um, is burnt tongue a sensation that she's experiencing or is it kind of... Um, you know, the idea that there's there's fire in her language or fire in her her words, fire upon the moors, you know, moors being generally sort of desolate or more abandoned, but this kind of symbol of light and burning and maybe hope or maybe destruction within that landscape. And then show me your smile. So that again the enjambment kind of you're expecting, show me your teeth, but it's show me your smile. So here we've got a different sentiment you know the darkness of the night and the waves breaking and and the snarl have now become a smile we've got your one bright eye you know she referred to the eye singular before there's the the eye that's working is bright it's no longer looking into the darkness um maybe a kind of turning point this this um pivotal point almost and shed your skin like a snake um, now, snakes kind of slough. They have this process where they lose um, the top layer of kind of um, skin cells from their body. And, and if you find a slough, it kind of looks like an empty snake because they can often come off in, in one go. But, you know, the idea of rejuvenation, the idea of shaking off the old dead kind of covering and carrying on in this new regenerated form. And I find the line, let that mask melt off your wrong red mouth, really interesting because of the number of meanings I think it could have. It's, it's kind of monosyllabic instruction is quite brutal and honest. You know, it is an order, I think, to herself about how she's going to face the world. And I want to know whether or not the mask is a clinical mask, like a face mask, and she's at the... Um, doctors or at the hospital or whether it is a mask that is a facade a kind of front um and if we we're going to write facade remember it's got the accent underneath the c to soften it you know a facade is a false front so the mask melts the kind of melting being mimicked by the alliteration there and allow the mask to melt off your red mouth and the red mouth is wrong so is this is this mask the makeup that she's wearing? Is the mouth wrong because um, it's kind of drooping because of her facial paralysis? It looks wrong. Is this a kind of plea of who am I trying to fool by putting this makeup on? It just looks kind of strange. Or is it, you know, I'm putting on a front that I need to drop. I need to kind of tap into this power that I've got. Um, or is it kind of, you know, take the mask off um, the, the medical mask off um, from over the lipstick, from over the kind of mouth that, that looks um, like it's kind of softened or drooped. But I think the complexity of that is something you can explore and, and get all of those ideas in there, you know, suggest in your writing that it could mean this, it could also mean this, right? Um, the end stop there is, is a kind of, again, clear sort of instruction, maybe a kind of decisiveness in how she's going to approach this and having let the mask melt off your wrong red mouth there's this um, instruction come fast through the grass so we've moved away from the medical scenario and into a kind of natural landscape of folklore these kind of folk stories because you know this power is some old monster finding its folklore its story its myth its legend and then the final repetition of show me your teeth is a kind of tying into that idea of, um, I think, kind of primitive power and monsters and, and kind of deep beast-like kind of um, desire to survive, almost. The show me your teeth progresses through the poem structurally from a 
clinical medical instruction that she's being given to almost like a rallying cry, a personal kind of instruction to herself to fight back and not accept what's what's happening to her, to harness the power of her own story. I hope you've enjoyed this poem. I really like it. Um, now go and look up the Guardian article. Okay, bye now.